right. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Lissa. Um, I also work at Los Alamos National Laboratory, but I'm in the High Performance Computing Division. Um, so let's talk a little bit about supercomputers. So as someone in the High Performance Computing Division, um, we are responsible. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, we're responsible for making sure that these huge machines run smoothly and reliably. And these machines are giant, and the kinds of sensors that we have on them are putting off uh, terabytes of data per day. So basically, in addition to the information that you get about the actual jobs running on the machines, we th see things like environmental sensors, uh, CPU temperatures, voltages, air velocities, air temperatures throughout these um, machines and the the current machine is trinity which is literally sitting in about a football size field um, room so we've got these gigantic facilities and our data centers can see a variety of different kinds of problems all of which we'd like to be able to detect and mitigate somehow um, so one of the things you can see a problem with is the actual logs things like sys logs um, these environmental sensors that I mentioned, which are also huge, uh, hugely instr instrumented systems here. Um, the actual environment that the machine is in, meaning the facility and the, the um, questions of building control actually in the building that the machine is sitting. Um, so things like the room temperature, where in the room is the machine, what altitude is the machine at, and specifically at Los Alamos, we're at a very high altitude, so you actually can see effects of that as well. Um, and then finally, you can see problems with the users. Is somebody submitting a job in a strange way? Um, is there just something strange in this kind of user, in this user behavior question? Um, so this is by far not an exhaustive list, but see, these are some of the things that we want to think about here. And, and part of this talk is that I'd really like to get, try to get people interested in just machine learning for high performance computing applications, um, because that's not something I see very much. And we've got tons of data, and in fact, a lot of it is kind of very nice, clean data to work with. Um, so if that's something you're interested in, you should really think about getting into this area. Um, yeah. So in this talk, I'm specifically going to look at anomaly detection for the sensor data on these machines. Um, and some of the goals that we have are just to catch early warnings of really any kind of system health problem here. Um, a high, an unusually high temperature on a CPU could mean that the, the workload is really just too heavy. It could mean there's something wrong with the hardware. There could be a variety of things wrong, um, not just things like lightning strikes that are very obvious. Um, so we'd also like to be able to explain to the analyst looking at this data why we're alerting on some specific thing. So we actually have people sitting somewhere in a room whose responsibility it is to figure out what's wrong with the machine and look at this kind of data. Um, and if you have a system that's alerting them, telling them something is wrong here, it's going to save them a lot of time if they can go and actually understand why the system thinks that something is weird. So we're going for an interpretable solution here. Um, and then kind of the holy grail of this is to be able to assist in root cause analysis for the analyst, where the analyst can actually go and figure out what is the root thing that's causing this problem, not just that the sensor is weird, but what actually on the machine is causing that weird reading. Okay, so we're going to be talking about data from the Trinity supercomputer during phase one of its operation, which is open science. So this is before it's moved into any kind of classified government area. Um, and this is a 9,500-some node machine. So it's gigantic. Um, each node is, has two 16-core processors, each of which have 128 gigs of main memory. Um, so again, very large machine. And then the interesting thing about Trinity is also that it's water-cooled. So this is a picture of them actually installing the uh, cooling system for Trinity, water going under, under and through the machine. Um, very, very interesting infrastructure here. This is why I also mentioned building control at the beginning. Um, and this is kind of a new thing for us. So in terms of looking at the temperature and voltage on the machine, and those two can be correlated, um, this is also going to help inform us whether we're cooling the machine well or not and whether this new, um, these new ways of cooling are actually working. So I'd like to just give you a small example of what some of these sensors, uh, some of these sensor readings can look like. And remember, these are six of thousands of sensors, terabytes of data. But what you can see here is that 
each of these um, temperature readings actually has two normal modes of behavior. And now that can be because sometimes, you know, the the particular node that this sensor, or the particular CPU that this sensor is on just isn't being taxed very much, maybe it's idle, and then sometimes it's being used very heavily. And the max temperature for each of these CPUs is around um, 100 Celsius. So you can see some of these guys are really being worked and some of them really aren't, and there's this kind of bimodal behavior. So we'd, what we'd like to be able to do is detect anomalies that either fall way above, way below, or even in the middle um, between the two modes of behavior. Um, and now this is, this is kind of, this is true on a lot of the different types of sensors. This is just one very, very small example, um, and I want to emphasize that because in the end, in the future work, we're going to talk about um, how can we actually handle all of this data, data in real time. Um, okay, so this is, kind of, that's kind of the problem that we'd like to deal with. Um, so let's talk about how we're going to, going to try to deal with this. Uh, so there is uh, something called classifier-adjusted density estimation that was introduced by Friedland, Gensel, and Jensen um, fairly recently that is basically a way of doing kernel density estimation, but it's a pretty slick way, and it's going to give us uh, the interpretability that we want. So basically, you start with your original data set, and then you're going to learn a kernel density estimate from that. We're actually just going to use a uniform kernel density estimate, and that will be important later when we want to do our anomaly detection. Um, and so from that estimator, we actually generate fake data that um, is of the same, we, we generate a da fake data set that's of the same size as the real data set. And then we combine together those two data sets and feed them into a random forest. And the fact that we're using a random forest classifier here is important because it's going to give us um, probabilities out rather than just the class. Uh, and so what we do is we train this random forest to distinguish between the real and fake data. Um, and then the kicker here is that you then run your original real data through that trained classifier and get out predictions. And these predictions you can basically think of saying how real or fake is our data. And the idea here is if the random forest is saying there's a high probability that your data point is fake, then it's probably an anomaly. Um, so why does this work? I'll throw up one equation very quickly here. Um, basically, according to Freeland and Al, it turns out that you can write down your density estimate in this form, uh, essentially just using Bayes' rule. And what we do here is because the real and fake data, the real data set and the fake data set that we've generated are of the same size, uh, that ratio there is a constant. And then this uniform density estimate is going to be essential, is not going to vary based on uh, your data point. So that's also going to fall out. And we can get this term from random forest. And basically, ultimately, what we would like to do is be able to rank our anomalies. So really, the only thing that we care about here are the predictions from the random forest. OK, so this flow diagram here is all of that classifier-adjusted density estimation, which I'll refer to as CADE, C-A-D-E. Um, and then what we've done is added a little extension onto this, which gives us some interpret interpretability um, so we can kind of dig into why the algorithm thinks that something is anomalous. And then we've also added in some interaction with the analyst, so an analyst can go and say, no, this thing you just told me about is really a false positive. Um, go, go and silence that for me. So for the interpretable part here, once we catch an anomaly, and now this is an example of one decision tree from the random forest, when we see a data point come in that ends up on a leaf telling us that it's fake, what we do is narrow in on that particular path. Um, so we go and we look at that particular node in the decision tree, and we hop back up one from the leaf that we've fallen onto. And the question we're going to try to answer here is, how would that data point have to have been different in order for us to think it's normal? Because that is kind of the key question to understanding why the algorithm thinks that this piece of data is weird somehow. So what we do is we start walking back up the tree, we look at the thresholds on each node, and then if, we were, if that particular value were to have been different, so if we 
if our data point had been slightly different and gone down the other path from that node, would it have been classified as real? And in this case, it would have. And so that, that um, rule at the node is what we present to the analyst and say, is this a rule that's actually interesting to you or is it not? If it's a rule that is actually interesting, meaning we did find an anomaly, then we don't do anything and we keep that as part of our tree here. And if the analyst happens to say, no, that's a false positive, what we do then is say, okay, this rule isn't actually relevant, and we can either wipe it out and say, okay, everybody who falls into that bin now is going to be real. Thank you. Um, or you could, you could even change this so that instead of being labeled fake or anomalous, you would label it as an ignored anomaly. So that in the future, if you want to go back and say, how many things have I ignored? Well, you could do that if you wanted to. Um, so this is, uh, I should say, just an example of what we do with one decision tree. This does involve going through the random forest, and we do this for each decision tree that has classified that data point as anomalous. So we ran some experiments with this on the data from Trinity, uh, specifically on the blade controller CPU temperature sensors. Um, what we've done is inject a few synthetic anomalies, varying the number of anomalies, um, the values that are making the data point anomalous, and the number of features, so the number of sensors that are actually giving an injected anomalous reading. Um, and then we're going to report precision at five. Um, the interesting results here are really the qualitative results rather than the quantitative results. We really already know that this works as an anomaly detection method. So we get an average precision at five of 87% on these uh, injected anomalies, which is pretty good. Um, and we also notice that one spike in a sensor, so a temperature that's normal and then spikes and comes back, can trigger two alerts because you see kind of the change um, the change going up and then the change going back down because we do include temporal features here. So we include the raw features and we include the deltas also between each time step. So that delta going up and that delta coming down can cause two alerts, which depending on your application you may or may not want. Okay, so for the qualitative results, um, we are able to detect unusually high values, which can indicate unusually heavy workloads on CPUs. We can also detect those middle ground values, which can imply underused uh, hardware or even broken hardware. Um, and the interesting thing here is that this method is actually able to recover the rules that we use to generate the synthetic anomalies. So basically, when we know that there is an anomaly in there, it's able to correctly identify how that anomaly is being generated. Um, and I should note about these rules, um, you may think that we're actually going to get out, thank you, uh, too many rules from these random forests. You know, if you've got 200 trees, maybe each one is going to give you a rule. But what we do is aggregate a little bit. So if the rule that we're pulling out is, for example, a less than, you know, voltage is less than 1.5, if we find um, a bunch of trees with that crucial node there where you got less than 1.5, less than 1.1, less than 1.2, we aggregate that and take the min. So we get out a single rule for each feature that, um, that is being singled out as important. So what did we just hear about? Well, this was a tree traversal based extension to that classifier just a density estimation, which gives you an interpretable and interactive aspect to your anomaly detection. Um, it can easily recover the anomalies that we injected into this large Trinity data set. Um, and in the future, we're looking into trying to correlate anomalies between um, different kinds of sensors, and then even across those different data sources that I mentioned in the beginning. Do we see a change in CPU temperature when we also see something strange in the syslog or when we see some kind of strange user behavior? Um, and then also because we would like to eventually have this online um, streaming for our analysts, we need to figure out a way to handle streaming data in extremely large um, amounts of data. Like I said, this really is terabytes per day um, to the point where you almost need your own cluster to store the data. Um, so basically, I'd like to just plug at the end, um, we really need people working on machine learning for high performance computing. Um, this is a big area with a lot of interesting questions that are not trivial applications of machine learning. It really is a marriage of open questions in both fields. Um, so thank you, and I'm happy to take any questions. I did some work on large-scale anomaly detection, and one of the problems we always had, and basically we had to design ways around it, mm -hmm. is that even your method, most methods, require some, let's say, a recording or a training phase where you collect normal data. 
and you have a 9,000 node, nodes there, you don't have normal data. You have data with a lot of problematic nodes that you don't know about. Sure, yeah. Um, uh, yeah, so, and uh, go ahead. Uh, so my question is, uh, did you solve it somehow or, or uh, some idea of how, how would I solve it? So, I mean, for sure there could be weird behavior hiding in there that we don't know about, but we don't really have a way around that. Um, that the classifier adjusted density estimation um, just assumes that anomalies are so infrequent that you can say that your data set is a good representation of normal behavior. So, no, we're just working around it as well, I'd say. Hey, <clears throat> so uh, we're dealing with a similar problem in Microsoft uh, where we are getting logs from Word, PowerPoint, Excel and trying to, you know, develop anomaly detection for, uh, you know, crashes. So my, uh, our problem is how do you, like, we don't know anomalies in advance. So, I mean, we just have bulk of data and you said generate fake data and label that. So how do we label the data when we don't know what are the anomalies in the first place? So... Right, so the f so this actually, so it is a totally unsupervised algorithm. The random forest uses labels, but it's, the labels are generated just based on whether your data came from your real data set or the data set that was gener by, generated by the KDE, right? So you don't, I'm not taking an original data set and saying these are some anomalies that I know. I'm taking the entire original d data set and then generating a whole other fake data set and saying this fake data set is fake and this original one is real, even though there could be some anomalies hiding in that original data set. Questions? I saw that hand go up first, so. We have time for just two questions, actually, so. Thank you. Um, I was curious about the nature of the fake data that mm -hmm. you generated. So how different, I guess, did it look from like your normal data? And I guess a follow-up question, um, did you try to do that first method that you're talking about where you go and you label within your real data set what is normal and what is an anomaly potentially or was that just too tedious to even pursue? Sure, so I'll address the second half of that first I think. Um, so we certainly could, well, first of all, it would have been extremely tedious to go through this data and try and identify anomalies, but we really want to be able to find anomalies that are of a nature that we don't already know about. So if we were to go in and label it, the only things we would ever find were types of anomalies that we we're already aware of, and we'd really like to be able to find any kind of anomaly and not just limit it to the things that we can definitely define, off, define offhand. Um, so regarding the fake data, it's, um, so it's a uniform density estimate, meaning that basically for when you generate a new data point, you, for each feature, you just look at the min and the max of what's in your original data set and draw uniformly between them. So it looks fairly similar to your real data set because it's, you know, it's within the right ranges, um, but it's, it's different enough that the classifier is able to distinguish between them fairly well. Do you re <clears throat> excuse me? Do you retrain your models when you do a software deployment? Sorry. Do you retrain your models when you do a software deployment? Like uh, I've heard, like when you do like root cause analysis, the problem with it is when you update your software, you update your cluster, then you're kind of screwed at that point. So. Sure. Are you are you rebuilding the models every time you you update your software? And your um, so we haven't really tested that yet. This isn't deployed quite yet. Um, we just have a prototype. But my guess is that yeah, I mean you're going to have to retrain it at some point, and we still need to test kind of exactly at you know where does it break? How long is this good for? Um, yeah. Uh, hello, I have a question. So uh, if the model, I, I'm interested in how you use the like, uh, custom uh, agencies like a uh, feedback to retuning the model. So I think I have some similar issues. Every time you use a custom report tuning back the model, the precision goes up, but the recall will significantly drop down as mm. time goes by. So how do you handle this issue? So we haven't, we haven't tested this in the field yet, so I don't really have data to see um, 
how how the accuracy how the performance goes once we once people have actually started going into this and modifying it um but that's certainly something that we need to look into and i guess you could even test it with synthetic data but we haven't done that yet so yeah uh, if you have more questions let's, let's take that conversation offline thank you Lisa, again